Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Good evening to everybody. It is a great pleasure to be here back at the London Business School and talk to you, the, the next uh, leaders of business and the new generation. I want to say a great thank you also to everybody in the Middle East uh, Club for uh, organizing such a, such a great event. This is, uh, LBS is one of the top academic institutions in the UK, indeed in the world, and I think you are so lucky to be here and have the chance to absorb all this knowledge and uh, uh, exposure for uh, this time. I myself spent a lot of time in my education here in the UK at the Royal Air Force Academies in Cranwell, uh, the Command and Staff College later in Bracknell. And I, rather than, like you, learn about business, I learned how to fly. But trust me, it was no less difficult than your corporate finance lesson, for instance. <laughs> now, they say every one of us need or have a spark in their life as they go and look after success and look after their uh, uh, future. And I want to tell you just a small uh, story of me that I think brings the first memory of this spark. So when I, I was seven years old in, in, in Oman in the uh, countryside with my father, who was a public uh, servant moving into different areas. And near our house was a, a dirt strip where small airplanes, piston flying airplanes will, will land and take off. And every time they landed and every time they took off, they would fly over our house very, very, at uh, very low, low height. And I remember I was so mesmerized by this experience. You know, this is rural Oman where, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. And I remember every time that that airplane was going to take off, I would run to the uh, top of the roof of our house with a stick trying to, to reach this airplane. Uh, and I think that, that was, you know, that was my first uh, memory of uh, uh, wanting to become a fighter pilot. Many years later, I started as a fighter pilot in the Oman Air Force. And all I wanted to do was really just to fly fighters uh, and all the exciting stuff that goes with it. Later, as chief of the Oman Air Force, which gave me exposure to new experience, experiences and opportunities. The Air Force is not just a fighting force, and my job was not just to lead pilots. It was more like leading a small country within my country. The force was a macrocosm of Oman itself. I find myself dealing with people, planning, budgets, education, training, and so on. I saw young people fresh from school and was able to help mold them into successful, good citizens. In this way, at a relatively young age, I gained my first experience and my first few practical lessons in leadership. This went beyond the learning of theories and facts. I realized that practical experiences brings new perspectives that undoubtedly make for better leadership in the future. When Air Forces train you as a pilot, they teach you to become a sharpshooter, a sharpshooter of targets, but also a sharpshooter of opportunities and of success. This does not happen overnight, of course. You have to set your strategy and object objectives well in advance, then test and challenge your plans before going into action. There's a long list of checks that you do before you take off in a fighter jet and even a bigger list when you come to land. I have been blessed to lead a life that had allowed me to mix private and public service. Today, I am firmly in the world of finance as the executive chairman of Inviscorp and the chairman of the National Bank of Oman. 
All this is quite different to the military life. But in practice, there are a lot of similarities at the top. By the way, you don't need to be a fighter pilot to be a successful business leader. I, you don't have to do that. <laughs> so in addition to my years of studying here in the UK, I also went to the National Defense University in Washington, DC. And later, at the end of my military career, I went to the Kennedy School, where I did my master's degree in public policy, focusing on management of international institutions. I strongly believe in the value of education in shaping tomorrow's leaders. The whole experience of being educated brings a new perspective that certainly contributes greatly to any career. With this in mind, I want to share a few lessons that I myself have learned from my mix of public and private service. The military life was an exciting, fast-paced, high stacks, and sometimes dangerous. So I repeat, it's exciting, it's fast-paced, high stacks, and sometimes dangerous, just like the world of finance. So good preparation for a life in this field. But it was also where I learned about leadership. The leadership lessons I took away from the Air Force, I now put into practice nearly every day of my life. The first lesson, always remember who you serve. As I mentioned, the Air Force was sometimes a risky place. It brought hazards and challenges, and you, hold, you had to hold your nerve. Hold your nerve is one of the most important things that you do in, in, in business and in finance. In those challenging circumstances, one thing that always inspired me was the people of Amman, the people I had pledged to protect and fight for. But I was also inspired by the men and women I was called upon to lead. In this regard, I had internal as well as external clients, and I needed to be mindful of both when doing my job. The second lesson is that we function best when we work as a team. The notion of a team is often overused and sometimes does not mean what it really should be. In the military, it is self-evident, but it is vital in business too. In any company worthy of international respect, companies like Investcorp, for example, it is important that every single person knows understand and displays the highest standards of integrity, accountability, and fairness. An ethical lapse by even the most junior employee, an assumption based on less than adequate information or moving too quickly and with insufficient thought, have brought down companies and leaders in the past and will no doubt do so in the future. Whether in the Air Force or in private business, I would rather have 10 staff with moral integrity and certainty to their values than 40 more skilled individuals who lack those traits. The third lesson is, and, is to understand that the world is always changing. So we too need always to be innovating and evolving. If I showed you a picture of the planes I flew when I first joined the Air Force, you would think they came from the 1880s, not the 1980s. The need to keep changing is a lesson that nations have been learning in the hardest of ways from time immemorial. It's possible to get very good at one thing and really focus on that particular capability while missing out on other innovations going on around us. The lesson is never to succumb to your own confirmation bias. And while much change is easy to anticipate and plan for, the great disruptive innovations can revolutionize the way we live and work. Even the greatest leaders and businesses can be caught out and be wrong-footed if they rest on their laurels. This is one lesson that every business has to apply. Each day I ask myself, 
what we can do better. What can we do that we aren't already doing to improve our results? What do I need to change and who do I need to bring on board to make this happen? Take InvestCorp. It started 33 years ago, focusing only on a unique deal-by-deal -deal private equity model. It was a great model. By this model, but this model would not have survived so many crises in the financial and geopolitical world if it didn't have the dynamism to evolve and innovate. Over time, initial success needs to scale up and adapt. In our case, investors are always looking for a greater range of offerings, and this realization led to real innovation. One example is hedge funds that InvestCorp introduced more than 20 years ago at a time when even those in the business did not fully understand what the words meant. In this spirit, we're now putting InvestCorp on a new path of innovation, one that will take it to another level of growth over the next 30 to 50 years. Innovation and growth don't occur in isolation. We must recognize that without a higher mission and purpose, we cannot inspire. Like so many things, this again comes back to values, integrity, and living according to a code of conduct, be it written or unwritten, that guides you each and every day. I urge you to be guided every day by this understanding. Without integrity, without values, and without a core belief system, we're simply making it up as we go along. A value structure is a roadmap in war, in life, and above all, in business. And one more lesson. In business, knowledge is power. We can't succeed if we don't know both our markets and our clients very well. We have to understand the market, to analyze it and evaluate it closely. A deep understanding of micro and macro implications will allow us to make decisions much more rapidly and effectively. Of course, all this does not take place in isolation from competition. Look around you at LBS. You are some of the best brains in the world. You deserve success. But success isn't offered to the students of just one great university. Your competition today is global. Most world-class financial institutions recruit internationally, as we do at InvestCorp. We have more than 35 nationalities. Competition is a fact of life, and it is the combination of ethos, skills, and knowledge that will help you succeed. As I stand before you today, I'm excited at the contribution that you and your peers will surely make in the future in the business and financial world. Having studied at this great institution, you have already been earmarked for success. Who knows? Among you might be future leaders of firms like InvestCorp, or even InvestCorp itself. To live and study in a city like London, in one of the world's most vibrant economies, is a fantastic opportunity and a huge honor. But with this honor comes a duty to gain everything you can from the opportunity you have been given. To make every minute here count. To remain humble and self-aware as to what you have yet to learn. For those of you traveling back to different parts of the world, there is an even greater responsibility to return to your home countries and to use your newfound knowledge and skills for the greater good to contribute to your environment, to play your part in growing and developing talent. In short, to act as leaders. Before I conclude, allow me to add one more note about Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore. Those of you who have not read his books, I would say please read them. He was asked, what is the most beneficial thing about his travels around the world? And he said, he said, when he comes to places like 
Harvard, like LBS, he gathers a round table of few powerful brains and discuss and brainstorm with them things. When he goes back to Singapore, he's gotten two or three ideas that are good for Singapore. Uh, hello, my question is a more personal one. You talked about the need for higher inspiration. What is your higher inspiration, if you don't, if you don't mind me asking? What is my high inspiration? So for, 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 for instance, for InvestCorp, I think inspiration and success becomes a habit if you, you start on the right track. And I think I, I joined InvestCorp on the board of InvestCorp 2008, and I became the executive chairman of InvestCorp this last July. And I think the first thing, the first thing my mind said is how are we going to make this firm grow faster in the next 30 years? I think if you, if you do the right things, if you come to LBS and spend this time, and if you take this knowledge and do something good with it, I think this inspiration becomes a habit for you. I think you become somebody who does not want to stand still, who does not want to be negative, who does not uh, accept mediocre results. I think that is the inspiration that, that one has. My question is more of a personal one. Uh, as, a, as a chief of the, I used to be the chief of the uh, Omani Air Force, Normally, uh, you will get involved into politics, not in finance. Can what? you speak at the, uh, the microphone? Because I can't hear you very well. I'm sorry. Uh, as as a, you used to be the chief of the uh, Omani Air Force, uh, normally people who, uh, uh, who have been in such a position, they get involved into politics afterwards, not into finance. Why finance, not politics? Why finance, not politics? Yeah. <laughs> I think because it's easier, actually. <laughs> No, you know, uh, I think one of the things, it's part of the question about inspiration, I think. I think when I, when I left the Air Force, I had done everything that you could do, I think, in public service in a really good way. I flew fighters, I had a great time, I, uh, I ran an Air Force, I had 10,000 people under me, I had 100 and 50 airplanes under me. I, I did everything that you really can do uh, uh, in, in like a small country. And, and within it, you have everything from planning, the budgeting, everything. I really wanted to do something else. Uh, and uh, I wanted to climb another mountain. Uh, and I think going to the Kennedy School was a fantastic, you know, mid-career uh, change. Because there I go, I went from the great chief of an Air Force, who, you know, everybody calls you sir, and everybody does what you say, and everybody, everything is done for you, to actually being a student. You know, you do your own presentations, people don't know who the hell you are, don't care who the hell you are, and you know, they, uh, and you better, you know, be and perform like all the fantastic brains uh, that you had. And the Kennedy School was really fantastic for me because, you know, I had people who were as young as 26 years old, and the eldest was 71. All of them were fantastic brains. So that's what happened, I think. Uh, my name is Eli. You talk about leadership a lot. I hear a lot of people saying leaders are born, they're not made. If you think that leaders are made, how do you think you make a leader? Well, I can tell you, I, I don't think I was born leader. Because the crazy things we did as fighter flying, no good leaders would do them. <laughs> you know? So that is, that is, that is one. I think 
you know, I say to my children, for instance, they tell me, you know, what, how do we become, what, what do we need to do in life? And I say, if you take care of the basic things, if you study, if you go to good schools, if you get out, if you stay away from things that will destroy your lives, you know, like uh, drugs or uh, terrorism or whatever, success will come to you. If you, if you don't cheat, if, you, if you're truthful, if you work hard, things will come to you. And with it, you get experiences and you get exposure. And this is really what makes you a leader, N nothing else. You no, know, I don't think there's, there's, a, there's a secret. Of course, there are, there are some of us, there are people who, who know, who, who are better at speaking languages, for instance. But if you work hard, you will speak another language. There are people who know how, you know, uh, how to just treat people. And there are people who really don't like to be with people. But if they work hard on it, they'll get there. You know, so, so really, I think we humans are so flexible. If you put a target and you believe inside you that you want to do it, you will do it. As you became chairman of uh, InvestCorp, what, what in your mind is the biggest thing you can do to sort of make a change or, you know, do a game changer to make it you know, faster growing, bigger, etc. What's the what's the big thing on your agenda? You know, in InvestCorp, I think uh, we have our greatest our greatest resource is the talents that we have. Uh, throughout my life, I've really not seen a firm with so full of of good talent like like we have. And I think my job is really very easy because all you need to do is just say, look guys, I think we need to double our AUM in the mid-term uh, mid, uh, mid and we want to more than triple our profitability in the mid-term. Show me the roadmap to get there. That was it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kebi Sebastian. You talked about uh, the need to hold your nerve uh, as an important lesson, and of course this is about opportunities and adversity, is the segment. Can you give us an example of a time when, in business, you've had to hold your nerve uh, against all odds and how it worked out? Yeah, I mean, uh, having to decide between making a deal and losing a deal. Uh, but you really don't want to overdo one emotion or the other because you don't want to give the wrong messages. Uh, and you have all the pressures from one side or the other to actually take a decision at that moment. I think that's, that's always holding your nerve. Uh, and by the way, sometimes you get it wrong. <laughs> but I think you're satisfied because you've, you've really, you've held your nerve for a very good reason. Either you didn't have enough information, you didn't have enough gut feeling, uh, or you clearly saw a better future in this thing. I think it happens a lot. Adil Saadi, uh, Sloan Fellow, London Business School. Um, you talked about the biggest asset that, um, that your, your firm has is on people. And I'm sure there's a lot of uh, monetary incentives to motivate people. What about the intrinsic motivator that you employ in Vesco to keep this talent pool? Thank you. I think, I mean, away from the away from the financial stuff, I think, which is even more important than than the financial. I think people, uh, 
if they find that they are respected, if they find that they are uh, with what they say matters, the, the decentralization of, of the decisions is very important. People sometimes, you know, say, are they looked after? And immediately a lot of people think it is salary and bonuses. No. Sometimes are they looked after because are they given good job satisfaction? Are they challenged? Are they stretched? Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you, for instance, uh, an example that happened with us uh, two weeks ago. We rejected the, a big transaction because three, four of our youngest, youngest uh, staff in a committee said no. All the seniors thought it was good. But our rules say that no matter who, if this quorum says no, it's no. You know, those, those junior guys walk with their head high because they've really given it everything they know. And they've, they've said what really uh, is good for the firm. That kind of thing, I think, is so motivating for people. The other thing, of course, you see, I meet people who come from huge institutions who've left them. And I say, why did you leave? Why did you leave? He said, well, look, they tell me I am in a team, but I'm really not in a team. Everybody's competing with me. Everyone is just looking at me to, to beat me. That is not a good culture. And that is a culture that will drive a lot of people away. Well, thank you very much again. It's been a pleasure.